हेलो एंड वेलकम टू द फर्स्ट लेक्चर और यू कैन से चैट ऑफ आवर चैनल आई एम उधिराज योर लिटरेरी साइड किक एंड टुडे विल बी डिस्कसिंग समथिंग वेरी कंटेम्पोरि फ्रिकुएंटली इन आर डेली लाइफ वी हेयर पीपल से इंग्लिश पढ़े कि आगे मातृभाषा जानो इन सिंपल वर्ड्स वी हैव हर्ड द नेटिव डुएलर्स रेजिंग देयर वॉइस अगेंस्ट द पोस्ट कॉलोनियल माइंड सेट ऑफ द मेट्रोपॉलिस and hence today we'll be discussing the lesser known history of the present day consequences it is my humble plea to stick with the video until the end it might be a bit lengthy but trust me uh, by the time you finish watching you will have all the essential information and knowledge along with my personal literary recommendations that are directly relevant to the topic The first pioneering entity I would like to introduce is the East India Company founded on December 31st 1600. Basically a group of London merchants led by Sir Thomas Smythe petitioned Queen Elizabeth I to grant them a royal charter to trade with the countries of the eastern hemisphere. Just to let you know by 1600 English had evolved into a recognizable form uh, for its future development as a global language breaking free from the great vowel shift the renaissance influence the arrival of the printing press technology the contributions of shakespeare spencer the university of wits uh, sydney and the other playwrights and poets of the period who introduced new words and phrases thereby trade uh, expansion cultural exchange continued to shape english making it much more acceptable and expansive in its vocabulary and grammar Before we continue I would like to briefly digress to explore something really relevant and parallel so understanding the richness of the indian history helps us to appreciate the american history as well and the diverse narratives that shape both the civilizations and also highlights the differences in their respective approaches believe me this will enhance your understanding of the politics involved so the naming of the americas or the america occurred shortly after christopher columbus's first voyage to the americas in 1492 and it is generally accepted that the name derives from amerigo vespucci the italian explorer in 1630 governor john winthrop proclaimed to his fellow puritan settlers that we shall be as a city upon a hill denoting that all the eyes would be upon them The reason I'm sharing this is to underscore the relevance of our rich tradition as through the 1830s American romanticism was marked by numerous stages of American transcendentalism by the proto environmental aesthetics of the Hudson River school Also the Indian philosophy of aham brahmasmi meaning I am divine refers to the Hindu belief that the soul is connected to the god Both the philosophies share concepts of seeing divinity in oneself and nature. Likewise, there is this American poem Brahma by the inventive American writer Ralph Waldo Emerson, which captures the idea that it is not the physical world which is significant, but rather the spiritual, and thereby, as a result, light and dark, or you can say far and near, are illusory. The dialectics are illusory. Many of the writers and thinkers of the early republic like Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau were the proponents of the future. They were the hope and promise of the American dream. They urged that we live by principles and not by traditions. The idea was that the early republic could build something new, something innovative only if tradition was not a burden to the progress. Simultaneously, what our freedom thirsty country witnessed were the uh, companies shift from trade to politics the colonizers or the britishers attempt to civilize the wild bracket the termed as indians by their ways of promoting christianity and western education the next stage involved the orientalist anglicist controversy regarding the nature of education the company the british east india company was to impart to the local population in its territory Orientalists led by Dr H H Wilson and H T Princip advocated Sanskrit, Persian, Arabic as their medium of education. On the other hand, the Anglicists led by Charles Trevelyan advocated imparting the western education through the medium of English. Now there are a few key names related to this topic: William Jones and Henry Thomas Colebrook who discovered the ancient sacred Indian texts 
understood their meaning, translated them to the local Indian languages and spread values. In 1784, Sir William Jones founded the Asiatic Society of Bengal to encourage Oriental studies. So pardon the slight change in the frame. This is just me figuring out this whole YouTube thing and bear with me. Stick around. This will only get better from here. Hopefully. Anyways, we are discussing the important names, the key names. So Sir Thomas Munro introduced the Western education in the Madras University. Basically, he was the governor of the university and the Munro Education Commission suggests or recommends the creation of the collectorate schools in each district. Then came the vernacular press in 1777 when two presses were almost simultaneously set first in Calcutta by uh, James Augustus Hickey, famous for printing the first Indian newspaper, Hickey's Bengal Gazette, and another in the town of Hooghly by Nathaniel Bracey and Charles Wilkins, famous for printing the grammar of the Bengali language. Subsequently, in 1794, in 1794 arrived the first ever book by an Indian to be written and published in English. Travels of Dean Mahomet by Dean Muhammad, a British Indian traveller, soldier, surgeon, entrepreneur and one of the most notable early non-European immigrants to the Western world. In the book, he describes his travels of the period 1770 to 1775 as a camp follower to the Bengal army as it is moved around the Northeast India. A series of military conflicts are described along with the descriptions of the major cities like uh, Kolkata, Calcutta and Varanasi, Benares. Then on September 12, 1786, Charles Cornwallis took charge as the Governor General of the Fort William. And it was recorded by Sir Thomas Munro that Cornwallis declared a goal to make everything as English as possible in a country which resembles England in nothing. However, the first blueprint of English education in India was made in 1792. It was Charles Grant, the then director of the East India Company, who wanted to promote the Western education through the teaching. However, the first blueprint of English education in India was made in 1792. It was Charles Grant, the then director of the East India Company, who wanted to promote the Western education through the teaching of English. Uh, to advance the Indian society. He is also considered as the father of modern education in India. Thereafter, the Serampur Mission Press was introduced. It was basically a book and a newspaper publisher that operated from 1800 to 1837. The press was founded by William Carey, William Ward and other British Baptist missionaries at the Serampur Mission. Then in the year of 1813, you can say the fateful year of 1813, it was time for the Charter Act, which made the missionaries free to work on education according to their own time. After this act, the education of the Indian people was considered as an official responsibility of the company. In 1817, Ramon Roy the very prolific Ramon Roy did much to disseminate, you can say, uh, the benefits of the modern education to his countrymen. He also supported David Hare's efforts to establish the Hindu College in Calcutta and the Calcutta School Book Society was formed with the aim of publishing textbooks and supplying them to the different schools and madrasas in India. Also on December 11, 1823, he addressed the British authority to ask for the modern education in his letter to Lord Amherst. Now let us discuss the most important, the most influential figure in our entire conversation. Thomas Babington Maculay. He was commonly recognized as the father of English education in India. He was also the legal advisor in the Supreme Council India from 1834 to 1838. In his history of England, he expressed the superiority of the Western European culture and the inevitability of the socio-cultural progress. It is also an example of the weak history and still remains commended for the unique prose style. He is also famous for the most absurd remark. A single shelf of a good European library was worth the whole native literature of India and Arabia. 
In 1835, when he was tasked with settling the dispute between the Orientalists and the Anglicists, he passed his famous minutes in February, which the governor Lord Bentick in March passed with the objectives of spending only on Western education, closure of colleges that taught only Eastern philosophy and subjects, the promotion of the downward filtration theory which says that the Britishers believed that if they educated only a few upper class Indians, then the government was paving way for educating the masses, as education was expected to filter downwards. Creation of a pool of Indians who would be Indians by blood and colour, but English by tastes, opinions, morals and intellect, capable of serving British interests and remaining loyal to them. So, the English Education Act 1835 was the legislative act of the Council of India that gave effect to a decision by Lord Bentick to reallocate funds to spend on the education and literature in India. But by 1839, Lord Auckland had succeeded Bentick as the Governor General and Macaulay had returned to England and he contrived or you can say forced to find funds to support the English colleges set up by the Bentick Act without continuing to run down the traditional oriental colleges. He wrote his minute as well, November 24, 1839, giving effect to his decision. Next came the pivotal resolution relevant to our topic, relevant to our chat, the Magna Carta of English Education in India, 1854, the Wood's Dispatch by Charles Wood. It aimed to expand education in India by establishing a network of schools and colleges in all the major cities. The Calcutta University, the Madras University, the Bombay University were established were set up in 1857. The Punjab University in 1882, the Allahabad University in 1887. Also on promoting the vernacular languages in the primary education and introducing English in the higher education. On training the teachers on supporting the preservation of the native literature as well. This discussion on the Woods Dispatch brings us closer to another critical aspect worth exploring, the Hunter Commission of 1882. It was presided by Sir William Hunter, who was appointed under Lord Ripon, the then Viceroy of India. It tried to improve the education system in India by developing proper infrastructure, by adopting uh, policies of religious neutrality. It also looked into the non-implementation of the Wood Dispatch. Then finally, in 1902, uh, the Indian Commission of Education was formed as a body on the instructions of Lord Curzon, the Viceroy, who intended to improve the university education in India. Then after emancipation, after 1947, the Commission of University Education was appointed under the chairmanship of Dr. Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan in November 1948. Then the University Grants Commission, the UGC, came into existence on 28th December 1953 and became an organization of the Government of India by an Act of Parliament in 1956 for the coordination, determination and maintenance of standards of teaching, examination and research in university education. Also, there are these commissions that I think I should mention. First, the 1917 Sadler Commission Report to study the educational hindrances of the Calcutta University students. Second, the Kothari Commission, an ad hoc commission set up by the Government of India, formed on 14th July 1964, differentiating the language as a skill and as literature. They also recommended a two-stage examination process, a preliminary examination followed by a main examination. So, this finally concludes our discussion on the history of English education in India. However, as your literary sidekick, I must list the important authors and their works relevant to this topic. So, there is Braj Bihari Kachru, an Indian-American linguist prolific for his works on world Englishes and the alchemy of English. Then there is Gauri Vishwanathan's Marks of Conquests. Alok Mukherjee's The Gift of India, Rajeshwari Sundar's The Lie of the Land, Edward Fairley Oten's A Sketch of Anglo-Indian Literature. There are numerous books on this topic, but specifically I want to mention A.K. Ramanujan's Cultural Essay, 1900 Cultural Essay, Is There an Indian Way of Thinking? 
which explores the cultural ideologies, talks about the behavioral manifestations in terms of an Indian philosophy, which he calls context sensitive thinking. And it also relates to Mark Twain's perspectives of being an American. And also G. Subarao's Indian words in English, where Rao examines how words from languages such as Hindi, Sanskrit, Tamil, Urdu have been integrated into English over time, reflecting India's cultural and historical interaction with the English-speaking world. Rao's research sheds light on the diverse sources from which English has borrowed words, ranging from the everyday words like that of yoga and bungalow to scientific and technical terms like that of avatar or pandit. Then we know the first play in English was written by Krishna Mohan Banerjee entitled The Persecuted in 1831. However, the real journey of Indian English drama began with Michael Modushudan Dutt's Is This Civilization that appeared on the literary horizon of 1871. And the first novel in English, Raj Mohan's Wife, published in 1864 by Bonkim Chandra Chattopadhyay. Additionally, I want to mention a few important translations, namely of Charles Wilkins. He was the first European to translate the Bhagavad Gita in 1785 directly from Sanskrit. William Jones, known for his contributions on the grammar of the Persian language and also for his translation of Kalidas's Sakuntalam in 1789. And Ralph T. H. Griffith's translation of the Valmiki Ramayana. He held the position of the principal of the Banaras College. So, transitioning to 2024, as per the Constitution of India, Hindi in Devnagari is the official language, despite the regional disapproval. And English is the additional official language. And 22 different languages have been classified as recognized languages as per the 8th schedule of the Indian Constitution. Basically, we have got a bunch of languages around us. But still, English is the universal high five that helps us connect with the rest of the world. Imagine trying to binge watch your favorite show without subtitles. A total chaos it will be. From job interviews to auditing street food, English has your back. English is the language of opportunities. Whether one is chatting up a storm with the tourist or one is sealing a deal in the boardroom. Thereby we can, we should conclude with the view that English is still the real MVP here in India. Thereby we should love the language, accept the language and make the language our own according to our own convenience. If you are happy with the video, if you are happy with the research, let me know in the comments. I have worked really, really, really hard and make sure you hit like, share and please subscribe to the channel.